Great. We did it. We are live. Mr. Bobby Lee, I'm excited to have you on the Around the Coin podcast. Uh, Bobby, you are the CEO of Ballet, and you also just wrote a book. Uh, let's start with the company yes. first. Can you make, give a little background as to how you got into Bitcoin and more specifically how you started this company, Crypto? Uh, sorry, how you started Ballet? Yeah, sure. So I got into crypto 10 years ago, started uh, as a sort of uh, amateur mining Bitcoin myself in a, in my bedroom in Shanghai. I found out about Bitcoin from my brother, Charlie. So we, we both got in in early 2011. And uh, this actually marks the 10 year anniversary. So it's, it's, this is a very special year for, for me. Uh, yeah. And my first startup was actually called BTC China, later renamed BTCC. That was the very first Bitcoin exchange in China. So I launched that in 2013, uh, CEO, co-founder. And then I sold that company, got acquired in early 2018. So ran it for five years uh, and then exited. So made some money from that, happy about it. And also um, took a year off. And then later, by, by, two, by early 2019, I had the itch to do another startup in Bitcoin. And what I discovered was that uh, wallets, storage of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency was still very hard. So I decided to tackle that problem and make essentially make the world's easiest to use wallet, cold storage. So we have it right here. It's called Ballet, Ballet Real Series Real Bitcoin. Uh, it's a cold storage wallet, stainless steel, uh, completely offline. And it's really easy to use. I think all the prior cold storage wallets, especially the electronic ones, were very difficult to use. So this is where we, we combine the, the two holy grails, which is safety and ease of use. So this is a very innovative product, and I'm very happy to have launched this uh, two years ago, and we're off to a great start. And, and technically, what is uh, unique about this? So you're holding up the card now for people yeah. who aren't looking at the video. I see the barcode. I'm familiar with uh, like a uh, tens. Um, what are other hardware wallets? You usually have... You know, you have the like so, uh, the USB yeah. format. Yeah, so there, there are several very popular ones. The very first one, electronic hardware wallet, was made by Trezor. Uh, mm -hmm. Trezor, um, they, they have several models over the years. And another very popular one was made by Ledger, the Nano S, and the several later models. Uh, there are many, many models. There, There's a, over a dozen or t more makers of hardware wallets. And all of them are traditionally electronic devices with computer chips in them and all that. And what I and I use them myself, by the way. I've used them for many, many years. But what I've discovered is uh, they're really ill-suited for for what I call regular people, whether it's my my uh, my family members, my cousins, my parents, or even children. Right? Impossible to use. So what we come up with is a is a device where uh, we still maintain the security of a hardware wallet, cold storage, which means that your crypto private keys are not stored on an online device. It's not connected to the computer. Okay. And rather it's in a, in a hardware device. Uh, in this case, it's, it's on this card itself. It's a stainless steel card and there's no electronic components. And the purpose is there for longevity and durability. So unlike hardware devices, which requires a lot of firmware updates, you know, software patches, um, and also there's compatibility issues, whether it's USB, micro USB, USB-C. These days, some are, some are Bluetooth 4.0, Bluetooth 5.0, Bluetooth, whatever future is standard. And uh, so all these, all these you know, technical stuff we avoid by making it just a QR code. It's vision-based, right? Mm -hmm. So what you see here is not a barcode, but it's a QR code. It's a two-dimension uh, square QR code. And then what happens is um, if you if you... If you peel off the, the, the sticker, you, you can actually peel off the sticker like this. Hold on. So you can peel off the sticker. Mm -hmm. Okay. And by peeling off the sticker uh, on the back, you peel it off. And on the back, you have the uh, the encrypted private key in yellow. Got so it. now you have the encrypted private key. And then further, there's a scratch off on the bottom. Okay. So you can scratch that off. So the idea here would be this is a one-time use private key. Um, is that so? So just just for reference, every Bitcoin. So for high security, uh, if you talk to crypto experts, all Bitcoin addresses should be one time use. The, the notion you should not reuse a single address, you should not uh, send multiple payments 
to a single address. So that's like the higher sort of geek standard, okay? Um, so certainly if you want to adhere to that, it's a one-time use. It's good for storing, for hodling. So if you want to store Bitcoins on here for five years, you want to you know move here five years, 10 years, uh, this is great for it. In fact, we're the only crypto wallet designed for a 20-year lifespan. Think about that. No other wallet out there, especially cold storage hardware wallet, really has that long of a lifespan. I mean, what's going to happen to USB uh, and Bluetooth standards in 20 years? What's going to happen to NFC standards in 20 years? So that's why even, even if the QR code standard changes in 20 years, we think cameras in the future will still be able to read this QR code. And if not, all of our all of our wording on here is in is in uh, is actually in plain text, so humans are readable. You can still read it using uh, using your eyes. So as long mm. as we don't, as humans don't go blind in twenty years, this will be valid. So back to yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you think this would is is the idea that this uh, I can't quite see on here, but would this survive a fire? Like, is it would it be engraved either now or in the future into the card? So it's laser, the the <clears throat> the password is laser etched onto the card, and oh, then nice. the the uh, the encrypted private key is actually on this uh, on this yellow backing. So this is not the yellow backing is not fireproof. In fact, nothing in the world is fireproof. So you need to put this in the fire safe, uh, fireproof safe, or somewhere where there's no fire damage uh, for for truly long term uh, storage. So one thing people don't realize is. Um, the world that we live in, fire is a common enemy. I don't care if it's artwork. I don't care if it's uh, money, uh, antiques, or a- anything. E- even electronic hardware wallets are not fireproof. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the that's the common evil. But that's why they make uh, facilities for storing things that are fireproof. And if you really have things that are of that nature of caliber, then you really want to have – like if you have a Picasso painting uh, – you would you wouldn't just toss it somewhere. You would want to put it in the safe storage. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious to ask you about this because I'm sure you know more about it than I do. But if I have, uh, <laughs> not maybe not me because I certainly don't. But if one <laughs> has, um, you know, say you have hypothetically a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, you could put that in a safe and it, and it's not a big deal. But there's yeah. some amount of money where. Sure. I, I I just the amount of nerves you would have. Say you had like you know you you invested ten thousand in Bitcoin. You know day one, it's now worth a hundred million. Oh yeah, you're not you, gonna. You're right. Where are people? Where are people in practice storing this amount of Bitcoin? Are there? No, you're, is it, you're absolutely right. So so this is a great question. Um, this is something we should talk about because people who are buying a thousand or ten thousand dollars of Bitcoin today should perfectly feel safe to store it on the ballet wallets. Mm-hmm. However, when that grows to a million or $10 million, and whether it's one year, five years, or 10 years, you know, if it's 10 years, if it's really like like millions of dollars, I would really spend time to learn about all the different varieties of storage devices, all the different varieties of backup, all the different varieties of custodial versus non-custodial. So basically, basically, if, you know, once people have large amounts of Bitcoin value, then they should really spend the time to do that. But the point is, for us, ballet is is saying, hey, you're just getting on board now. You're no corner. You're a new corner. You're buying Bitcoin and cryptocurrency for the first time. So I don't care if it's Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Ethereum. You, you want to st- find a way to store it easily offline and have custody of it. That's the most important thing. You want to have custody of your Bitcoin so that you're not relying on an exchange or some other custodial platform. Because we've seen so much go wrong with custodial platforms, whether it's uh, KYC requirements, exchanges, platforms getting hacked, or whether your own account getting hacked because of someone doing a SIM mobile number hijacking of your SIM card, right? So there's all these horror stories of people losing their coins because of, of custodial storage. So that's why I want to bring you know, unhosted wallet, non-custodial storage to your own hands in an easy-to-use fashion. And when it. the value goes up, you have to you have to spend time because you know one one of the things I learned in 2018 when I took my year off after I sold my company, it's a true story. I bought a dozen of those hardware wallets. Okay, I won't name the brand. A dozen of them, like ten of them, and I gave them out to my friends and family. And and of course, I, I'm a user. I'm a user of them. That's why I gave them out. Now, what happened was I realized, wait a minute. You know, none of them figured out how to use it. They couldn't use it. It was too hard for them, and many of them were in the crypto industry. So I, I actually had to hold a two-hour lecture session 
to say, okay, come on over. Let me teach you how to use this. I'll go through the best practices and so on and so forth. And that was in the fall of 2018. And after that episode, the light bulb went off. I need to really find an easier solution for normal people. If my colleagues and Bitcoin crypto people can't do this properly, then I need to find an easier solution. And this is the product we created. That, yeah, sounds, that sounds painful. Yeah. Um, and, and and the company now is just uh, fill yeah, me it's, in it's on a, the gaps here. You're, yeah, you're sure, headquartered sure. in the US. You've raised yep. some money. Uh, like, yep, it's, is, yeah, the website yeah. is Ballet Crypto. So if you if you want to go to the website, we could talk about it in parallel. So BalletCrypto.com. Uh, it's headquartered in the US. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an American. So my last company was in China. This one, we want to do it in the US because uh, we don't want to board all the Chinese regulation. Uh, however, we do have a software R&D center manufacturing uh, vendor procurement facility over there in China. Our headquarter and, and f- final manufacturing is in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is where I'm based. So um, essentially, essentially, we have. Uh, so yeah, what was the other question about the headquarter oh, I, location? I, I, I'm curious where you guys are in terms of uh, money raised. It looks like you raised oh, yeah, yeah, some yeah. seed capital so, from Ribbit. Yeah, we raised uh, we raised three million led by Ribbit. Uh, that was two years ago in 2019. Yeah, and uh, so it's been doing very well. We've seen traffic go up. Mo- most importantly. Uh, because all the data on blockchain is public, we know across all our wallets. Uh, first, first of all, the private keys are held by the users. Okay, whoever our customers are, they they own the private keys, and and uh, there's no question about the security and safety of that. Um, but however, it, from a blockchain analysis, we know that users collectively worldwide now have entrusted ballet technologies with over two hundred and fifty million dollars worth of crypto. So that's a quarter of a billion dollars on this wallet. Last year, a year ago, it was just 10 million. So we went from zero to 10 million and then from 10 million to $250 million. So that's a, that's a real significant accomplishment. Yeah. Very happy about that. Wait, I want to ask you a potentially dumb question, but I maybe just don't understand it. So when you, you make these cards in some building with some people and machines, presumably uh, yep. in Vegas or in China, Yep. In Vegas, both actually, both, both, both. Yeah. Uh, when you when you create the private key, you put a sticker over the private key, but the private key is printed on there by a machine. Is that is that how does that tactically work? Is it is yeah, the private key generated? <clears throat> yeah. So we actually use what they call a two factor private key. So think about think about. I don't know if you've hmm. seen those safe deposit boxes in banks. These really fancy vaults where two guys with two different keys, they use this in nucleosidal missiles as well, right? Mm. You've seen these story, uh, movies where one guy has key A, one guy has key B. They both have to put it in and, and turn the lock, and then the thing unlocks. So this is the same thing, okay? We use a two-factor private key. So so the card you see here, the one factor is um, this this encrypted private key, the QR code. By the way, there's text beneath it. Okay, everything is human. Is there readable. any Bitcoin on this card specifically? Uh, there's no Bitcoin on this card. If there were, <laughs> if there were Bitcoin, by flashing it on the screen, then people anywhere in the world who views this can screen capture and take the Bitcoins away. Okay, mm-hmm. so th- that's the beauty of Bitcoin. It's it's a transmission by by information, which is by video information works as well. So one factor, this is done in China. Uh, this is meaning that the, the source material for the key, the random generator, the random number generator, all of that is done in China, and it never leaves China. And the moment it's printed on uh, into these stickers, it's a, this, the, the data is destroyed. And the second factor is the passphrase here. This is the twenty-digit, you know, Got twenty. Uh, yeah, that's a passphrase here. And this is um, done and created in the U.S. Also on an offline computer never connected to the internet. And the moment it's laser etched on here, the data is deleted, okay? So these are two separate teams. So so, so that's why even, even you know, you, you, we buy these, um, we buy these like master locks, right? From, uh, from, from hardware store with a key, right? Those, those, these master locks with a key, it, it comes with a key, right? Mm-hmm. But there's only one key. So in this case, we're actually preparing a wallet for you where there's two keys and the two keys are created in two different countries. And uh, this is the beauty of our system. So we have, guys, of course, yeah. If you, if you were to hypothetically lose your side of the key in the two key process, does that mean people can't access the Bitcoin? You mean us the manufacturer or one of the, yeah, given your your example there with the you know two keys insert and that there it goes. Oh, both, so by the way, both keys just just to clarify, the both keys are held by the customer. So the end got product it, actually it. has both keys on it. 
the end product, the one key is covered by the sticker, the other key is covered by the scratch off material. So all, they're got tamper it. evident. Yeah. So that's why the got manufacturing, it, it. it's first done in China, it's covered up, and then it comes to the US for the laser etching, and that's covered up. Oh, right. and then it gets sold. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's like a, the it's beauty a of having. Yeah, it's like the the Chinese American uh, <laughs> partnership that makes this possible. <laughs> the rivalry. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What do you think? And we, uh, and plus, we we it's it's purposely we choose two different jurisdictions, and these are not jurisdictions that's going to be friendly to each other. So, in other words, even if the Chinese government comes and coerces us to do something, we we, we can only show them. You know, at worst, we can say, okay, here's our process here in China. But they, they can't do anything about the process in the U.S. and vice versa. The U.S. government, if they come and coerce us to do something, they can only see the U.S. side. They can never they, they can't get to the China side. So Ooh, these are two jurisdictions brilliant. that that's that that don't have extradition treaties or anything like that. So so you know so that's that's how we ensure the integrity of the product. Yeah, you're you're kind of like betting that the security is baked in by the fact that uh, these two countries aren't going to be cooperating anytime soon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's too but funny. It's, it's really true. It's really true. What, what in your experience? You you started the first Bitcoin exchange in China, yes, or yes. in the world in China. What but was China, uh, yeah? yeah it, what what is China? What does China's regulatory landscape look like today versus the U.S. In your opinion? Uh, in crypt, you're talking about crypto, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. I write, I, I write about this in my book. By the way, my book is called um, "Here We Promise Go." Bitcoin. Yep. It's, there's Promise a there's a whole Bitcoin. chapter, a long chapter about regulation, and um, so so China today, unfortunately, like, okay, the people love crypto. The people in China love crypto. Like like I'm in the U.S. and I'm in China, and I have friends in both countries, just casual, you know, regular friends, non crypto people. In China, my regular non-crypto friends come and ask me about Bitcoin. They're like, "Oh, you know, I want to interested in this. I'm looking to mining and stuff like that." These are no, these are non-crypto people, okay. Whereas in the U.S., non-crypto people is like could care less. So, so, so in my circle, in, you know, whether it's young people, or whatever, people in China are generally more aware of crypto. However, the government is really scared. I think. I think, okay, they, they technically haven't said that, um, but they, they don't like it, meaning they ban it. They don't allow crypto. Okay, so let me clarify. What they do is they don't they ban it from the use in society. So they don't allow yeah. stores, whether it's McDonald's, Starbucks, or department stores or restaurants. They don't allow any businesses to accept or transact in crypto. However, because cryptocurrency is a digital asset, the government does recognize it as a valid sort of private property. So in that case, people are allowed to own it. So by owning it, it's not illegal. So unlike if I were to own, if I were to have marijuana or cocaine, that's illegal. I would get arrested for that. Even owning a gun is illegal. Okay, I would get arrested for that. Whereas owning crypto, no problem whatsoever. I can I can have crypto on my ballet wallet. I can hold on to it, no problem. And I can even hmm. transact with a person to person. If I meet someone in China, I can give them ballet wallet. They can give me some money, you, and that's no you think problem. That's- yeah. Is is that their is that their long term position on this, or do you think that's kind of oh, position it's, it's, until they figure it out? Like, how it, can they do that? Right? It's like, you, yeah. okay, you can own it, but you can't use it. Yeah, it's it's weird. The the, the, the Chinese, you know, the constitution they have is not it's it is not the same kind of thing as in the U.S. where we have more more you know constitution gives us more rights and stuff like that. Uh, I would say I would say you asked if it's a long term. I would say in China, nothing's permanent. So I, if you recall, decades ago, they had something called the one-child policy. Mm-hmm. And um, th- these days, it's, it's no longer in force. It's no longer in, in play. The one-child policy has been abolished, if you will. Um, I, I, I forgot exactly which year it got abolished, but, but it took decades. It took literally 20, 30, 40 years for that policy to get abolished. So nothing is permanent. You know, as long as, so that's my point about, about the ban on crypto sort of business transactions that could go as long as you know a few decades like the one child policy or it could get reversed in in a few years right depends i think i privately i think that um china is looking at the rest of the world the regulatory regimes around the world especially the united states depending on what the u.s does china is very keen on understanding what the u.s does and what the u.s will do and they will change their policies accordingly Oh, interesting. Yeah. And yeah. so th- right now they're currently allowing people to buy. So buy you can go on Binance as a major exchange there and you can uh, go as well no, as No, others. no, 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 no. This, well, actually, yes and no. So Binance is a major exchange. What, what you cannot do is the exchanges cannot serve the China market. 
So you may not know this, but in late 2017, all the Chinese base exchanges, including BTCC, BTC China, our, our platform, there are other ones like OKCoin, Huobi, and Binance, mm-hmm. they all had to close down and withdraw from the Chinese market. So they had to stop serving the Chinese customers locally. So what they do is they all moved offshore. They all set up offshore entities. And what they then did was – because all the exchanges were then blocked by the Great Firewall of China. So they then still service the Chinese customers through an underground fashion where the, the local people in China technically are not allowed to use an exchange based in China. And by the way, technically, there are no exchanges based in China, except they all have offices there. That's the irony, right? So <laughs> they, would then, they would then use a VPN software to get over the firewall and access those websites, access those mobile apps, load the money, do the trading – and it's all sort of, sort of, uh, yeah, it's kind of like that. Wow! And so this is happening at scale. Like I imagine that at people scale will, at huge yeah. scale, absolutely. Yeah. And China That's, cannot be happy with this. I mean, they're, they're intentionally people are intentionally going under or around the wall with VPNs using these yes, exchanges. Yes. And not not just that. This is not the worst part. The worst part is not just the VPN. The hard part is actually the money flow. Right? The money flow is even more tricky than the VPN because think about it. How do you send money to an offshore exchange like Binance and Huobi? even though the people running it, operating are really just in the same country, right? So the bank accounts are all foreign. So they rely on network. Of, this This gets really icky. This is yeah. why I got out of business. So we don't do that. I'm glad I sold my company. Anyways, yeah. so so they rely on a network of these money movers, these, these, uh, these sh- kind of shady people who just move money. Technically, in my opinion, they're all laundering money because that's, mm-hmm. but that's what they're doing, right? But, yeah. but you could argue that it's, it's, it's not laundering in the sense that it's not illegal profits. So money – by the way, I have a whole rant about money laundering itself. So, um, so that's what they rely on, on these networks of mon- people who move money. They use a lot of USDT stablecoin. So um, – uh, by the way, USDT is not not anything here, but in in Asia, it's all it's all the rage. USDT, the the the, the, uh, the tether pegged to the tether, to the US exactly, dollar. exactly. Why is that the rage? Well, it's a rage because what they do is for people in China to buy Bitcoin on these platforms, it's a two step process. They have to first find someone to sell to convert the local currency called renminbi. They convert the local renminbi to USDT. So they get they get crypto, but they don't get Bitcoin crypto. They get stablecoin mm-hmm. crypto. Okay, so that's one step, uh, and that's an involved process. Once they get the USDT, the USDT again is on the exchange. It's not it's not physical, right? It's it's, and it's this, virtual. This, even even that process going from going from the local currency to USDT that is not uh, allowed by the US by exactly. the Chinese government. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's non kosher. It's it's underground. Mm-hmm. So once you get on USDT, now you're on the platform, Binance, mm-hmm. you know, Huobi, whatever. And this is where you use a VPN, okay, to get on the platform. And then from there, you just buy BTC with USDT. So there's an active trading pair, USDT, BTC, back mm-hmm. and forth. So it's, then, you, then you buy the Bitcoin. And then the third step is you withdraw the Bitcoin, ideally to a hardware wallet, whatever, or you mm-hmm. leave it on the exchange, which is uh, which would be terrible. Yeah. Well, it's still better than maybe an alternative leaving it in a Chinese bank account or something. And the major motivation uh, well, for people well, doing actually, this? Well, actually, I, I, don't, I don't agree. I'd rather you Tell me. leave uh, – I'd rather you leave – basically, if you're going to buy Bitcoin, you might as well take it out. If you're not going to take it out, you might as well not buy Bitcoin. I'd rather you have r- r- local currency because because the risk is just, just uh, ridiculous in terms of uh, putting on an exchange. And do you think the risk, say, for a Chinese person is that the Chinese government would have a grip into, say, Binance? They say, hey, we're going to, you know, some threat, we're going to do something, and then yeah. you better give us access to yeah. everyone who has these coins. Yeah. And Absolutely. There's been multiple occasions where exchanges are coerced to cooperate with the government. I have firsthand experience. I can't talk about some of the details, but coerced, right? So recently, um, um, th- this happened about six, eight months ago. Uh, OKCoin okay in China, their CEO, you know, Star Shu, was so-called detained by the by the government, uh, the police, and put in custody for like 30 days or whatever, however many days. And during that time, because he was a critical component to the withdrawals, OKCoin okay could not process their Bitcoin withdrawals for their customers. So for a long time, for over like a month, people who had their money on OKCoin okay were stuck and basically left out in the cold. And, you know, at that time, some people worry they'll never see their coins again, like like empty Gox. Oh, my God. That's crazy. Right? And, and thankfully, you know, for the industry, I'm really happy. Thankfully, he got released. Like, he shouldn't have been jailed. 
Uh, and then they they let him sort of uh, he, and then Okikon resumed the withdrawals. Uh, I think it was in November, yeah, yeah. Or December. It was it was a so long, effectively long this is this is creating an enormous. Would you be would you agree with the statement that it's creating an enormous amount of tension in China between the citizens and the government because it gives the people the power effectively to? I mean, money is is an incredibly powerful asset and when you can move it around you can send it to people anywhere in the world the chinese yeah. government loses its grip on a lot of the control that it has it can still influence local businesses and say hey if you accept bitcoin or you you pay out in bitcoin we're going to come to your door and we're going to threaten you you know with guns ultimately that's what the governments have that people don't is firepower you know yeah. at the end of the day uh so but they don't have access to information transfer. They try to limit it through the exactly. firewall, but it seems like the VPNs is the game. It's the cat and mouse game. If you can, if you're a Chinese, game. if you're a Chinese citizen and you can get access to an exchange, well, now you're in business because once you can get into the crypto game, you can nothing stop. You can't stop anyone across the world from once you're in crypto. You know. It's a lost cause for the government. They can't exactly, stop Mike. You're exactly right. You you've nailed it. This is the core, the crux of the issue. Why crypto is important to human society. And by the way, it's not just China. China happens just to be one of many countries who have capital controls. And by the way, the notion of capital controls is very foreign to people living in America and in developed nations. I grew up. I was born in the Africa and Africa in the country called the Ivory Coast in West Africa, and. Um, you know, those countries back then, many countries in Africa, many countries in Asia still have capital controls, meaning the government has strict policies about who is allowed to exchange U.S. dollars to the local currency, to foreign currency, and back and forth. There are strict limits in place for businesses, for individuals. So there's always a black market. Um, and, and I saw that in Africa. I saw it in, I see it in China. I saw it in China, and I still see it in China, in all parts yeah. of Asia, even Korea. Uh, even Taiwan, even Vietnam, Thailand, all have capital controls. Well, China seems to be particularly relevant, A, because they're just so populous. I mean, the, the amount of people there, four times the US population. So regardless of anything else, they have enormous influence. Then they have kind of a philosophical opposition to the Western world and that the government tr tries to and successfully does intervene in many of the business arrangements. So Correct. that's that's generally philosophically opposed to the West, which is like, yeah. you do business, don't screw other people over and we won't get yeah. involved, like yeah, generally yeah. speaking. And, yeah. and I think well, the other the other trend is like China's growing quickly and, and really entering the world. And they're also very technically savvy. So, you know, their ability to right. build a firewall and influence it. And so it's like, OK, that everyone in the earth is concerned about China. Not everyone is concerned about, you know, some, you know, Estonian company or, uh, you know, Estonian yeah, yeah. country. Well, let, let, let me let me let me be fair here. Even though I'm a U.S. citizen, I also live in China. Um, so to be fair here, China is not opposed to the Western perspective. What I what I would rather say is China's per, China has its own perspective, which happens to be different. Okay, now I'm not mm -hmm. trying to I'm not, I'm not trying to mince words here, but I think the Chinese mm -hmm. is not technically opposed to the Western perspective or standard. It's just it it has its, it has a strong culture. It has its own sort of perspective and culture and habits that happen to be we're finding out now happen to be quite incompatible with with mm -hmm. with the west and this is where the friction is where the new cold war potentially might lie yeah where do you think it is exactly like how, how would you articulate the the tension or the, the specific I, yeah, opposition? let me share with you let me share with you a perspective so so you know in america we lived in what we we live in the democracy, what we call the Western liberal democracy, right? This is probably the political term for it. And in China, the, the, the version is called the Communist Party. It's called like a total. It's I guess it's more an authoritarian state. Okay, some countries are worse. They call them a totalitarian state. So in China, it's an authoritarian state, and the they, they're different. Okay, they're different. And I've lived there for the last 15 years, and I've lived in the U.S. for, for much longer than that. I was born in it. I wasn't born, but I was educated uh, in the U.S. American system. So I'm very partial to the U.S. The liberal democracy system. So, for example, I would never swear allegiance to China or to the Communist Party or anything like that. Right? That would be for me. That's that, that's just not possible. Okay. So, so the the difference is that look at how companies are run. 
So even though in the in the United States and the West we have liberal democracy, but companies are not run democratically. So I've worked. My first company was Yahoo. I've interned at Microsoft, IBM. I've worked at EMC. I've worked at Walmart, and and now I run my own startup as a CEO. And I can tell you firsthand, companies we don't do things democratically, right? We we solicit opinion from employees and stuff like that. But in the end, when 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 it comes push and shove, you know, uh, what, what's expression? You know, at the end, if we have to make a decision, it bubbles up to the top. The CEO has to make a decision, and the CEO will be judged by the board of directors for for, for whether they made the right decision or not. Now, the shareholders do vote for the board of directors, which then votes for the CEO. So it's like a double funnel. One funnel is the shareholders voting for the board of directors, which elects the CEO, but then the CEO commands the senior management team, which then directs the the, the, the lower management team, which has all the employees. So it's like a double funnel. All, all, the single point is the, the, the CEO. So the companies in some ways are run like a totalitarian, authoritarian kind of organization. Does, does that make sense? Yes, the exactly. employees don't get to vote about company direction. It's not like a, they can give suggestions which, which way to go. But you, like most recently, Facebook policies about you know, Donald Trump, right? The employees don't get to decide. Now, Mark Zuckerberg tried to punt the ball and not decide himself. He, he, he decided to get a committee to decide that and all that stuff. So my point is China as a country is run much more like a company. Well, the, that's, would the, you, that's my insight. It, it seems to me, tell me if you disagree, but that the, the key distinction would be that the CEO of companies are are – are overseen by the board, which is which is exactly. elected by the shareholders. Where in China, exactly. it's not necessarily well, true. So let me right? tell you, no, no. Let me tell you about that. So back to the point. In China, that center person would be today is Chairman uh, Xi Jinping. Okay, so mm-hmm. he's like the CEO, right? You're right that in a company, he. So in China, the the, the structure is still there. He's technically elected by the. There's a committee, central committee, you know, there's like seven people or 12 people that elect him. And then that committee is kind of like the board of directors. And then the shareholders would be like the big communist party, whatever, you know, millions of people in the communist party. So they sort of elect the party committee, then elect the chairman. So they that's do. Kind of I the didn't process. realize that. So, the, so, the, so supposedly yeah. that's how it happens. I, I, I'm not <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm not I, I don't get involved in that. So I don't know whether yeah. it's legit or not, but, but that's the structure. So, and the, so kind of the country has this double funnel thing as well. So the Communist Party, blah, 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 and it boils down to the top, which is the chairman, you know, uh, mm-hmm. President Xi Jinping. And then, and, then the, and then the executive, they run, you know, the ministries and all that stuff. And then they run all the people, all the country like that. Yeah. So it's run like a totalitarian, yeah. authoritarian country. Uh, go, which actually uh, – yeah. I mean, so it, in, I mean, in that sense, it's more effective. It's very effective because it's like there's marching orders, so to speak. Well, I almost think like, how is that? Let's point out the differences between that and the U.S. Because the U.S. has a central person, the president, that is elected by largely the parties, right? You choose your party. Yeah. There's maybe three, four parties. That's kind of your 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 board is effectively screening them. Your politicians are your board. They're elected by the people. The difference yeah. here is I feel like term limits are the major factor. The fact that we have a four-year term limit. If we didn't have a term limit, what's the difference between the United States, yeah, yeah. So, political. so I, I personally, as I said before, I'm no shame in saying that. I much prefer the U.S. system. I think there's more what they call balance of power. There's a three branches of government, so important, right? You don't want these yeah, three branches yeah, yeah. do different things. Yeah, the lawmakers, the j- judicial system, and the executive branch that implements the system. The, that's why, that's why I, I tell people when I, when I <clears throat> get, when I get a speeding ticket in traffic, when I drive my car and, and speed, let's say get a traffic ticket, which I'm sure. <clears throat> all of us have had you know you know we're not guilty right away there's actually a due process now i can sort of declare my guilt and you know write the pay the fine and say okay i'm guilty do the thing i i, I you know whatever points get deducted whatever right but i actually i can go to traffic court and argue my case between be, be, you know in front of a judge and the, the other police guy has to show up and we have to sort of argue right so that's why even something simple as a traffic ticket you're not you, you're not guilty by presumption whereas in mm. china unfortunately that's not the case when you get in a traffic accident or a traffic violation the police that's catching you his word is final right right so it's really it's really sad right. right it's like he says you you ran the red light he says you speed he says you did this and that's it there's no appeal Which, process you know, it's nothing and I think it's going terrible. to be 
It's it, here. It, here's the here's the trade off. Is like, well, in China, in China with that system, the police officer and that executive force is going to be much more cost effective because you don't need oh, yeah, judges, yeah, exactly. you don't need anyone else. Exactly. So in the case where the guy is speeding, the cop is right. Like, look, the guy is speeding, the cop is right. You know, end of end of case. In the U.S., we go through process, we hire a judge, exactly. you guys spend time. Yeah, exactly. It's like you're trading off, and that's kind of what we see in practice. Is that the U.S. is slower, Efficiency. generally speaking. Yep. Uh, yep. We're we're less efficient, but it's it's the trade off is that we're more robust, more exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. So the the risk is that China, you know, with the few people who make an enormous amount of decisions, those people could be mistaken, and they could exactly. build a hospital in three days, but they exactly. might also make it make a mistake and and run off the cliff somewhere. And you're, it's you're like, exactly right, Mike. That's exactly it. This is the this is the situation here. So so anyway, so so you know my personal preferences, and you know that's how the world yeah. is right now. And it seems like so. So crypto is like the foundation to this. So crypto comes in the game and says, "Well, anyone, all of the people have access to all their own money, and the government can't touch it, and they can move it anywhere in the world anytime they want with any amount of money." Like in theory, right? There's firewalls and there's resistance to that, but generally speaking, that's the that's the promise long term. That, that I feel like that. Who, who who in practice, what citizen doesn't want that? You know, how does it hurt citizens? Uh, is this just a two, like, help me, help me think through your process, having yeah. both the Chinese and American viewpoints. Yeah. Is this now just giving all power to people across the world and, and sort of removing the control that more totalitarian states would have? Um, so yeah, how I do you see all, it playing out? I think people, so I believe in, in freedom. I believe in a world where, you know, long-term, as long as they're, as long as the world is free, there will be free countries with liberal democracies where where people elect their legislator, they elect, they, they enact their own laws. And in that worldview, crypto is essential. Crypto is the ultimate point, right? Because money is so important to society. Money is basically per people's, like people don't understand this. Money, I talk about this in my book. Money is actually people's labor. Like if you mm -hmm. enslave, if, if you, if you, confiscate money you're enslaving labor you're enslaving people right think about it money i have in my bank what is that it represents my hard work over the last few years it could be my summer job from 30 years ago it could be my first job out of college from yahoo it could be my the proceeds of my sale of my company so as an entrepreneur that's my hard work right no one should have the right to confiscate it now, you can tax it as long as the taxation laws are written by legislators whom I've elected to the government, in which case I've consented to the taxation, right? But if an arbitrary government says, I want to take that money or hold it or lock it up, then that's not cool. That You might as well just lock me up. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So that's Absolutely. why that's why I'm a firm believer in the notion of freedom of money. That That's, that's why crypto is so important. And by the way, I didn't come to this perspective 20 years ago. I I, I, I sort of started understanding more and more over the last 10 years of getting into Bitcoin. That's why I really thank Bitcoin, not just for the financial success that's brought me, but also for the intellectual success in the sense that it's really caused me to become a more of a thinker on this topic. Mm. What would you give your, what advice or pieces of knowledge would you give your, your younger self, say eight years ago, 10 years ago? I mean, other than we say, <laughs> assume, more assume Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, buy more Bitcoin, <laughs> maybe not advice, but how do you, yeah. what, how is your, your, uh, your philosophical bedrock shifted? How have you, I mean, namely, there's going to be an obvious trend in just becoming educated on how blockchain works. But aside from that, has it shifted your views on politics, economics, yeah, yeah. things? Yeah, it, it has. So first of all, but this shift happens gradually over the last 10 years as I learned more about Bitcoin. And again, it, like you said, it's not just the technology stuff. I don't want to get all into the details of technology, but it's really the economic, the social, the political aspects. And I would say I'm much more of a libertarian today than ever before. And I'm much more about, you know, the the liberty, you know, I, I'm I'm a much more I'm much more appreciative of the U.S. Constitution of the U.S. form of government. So, by the way, I'm I'm a I'm an immigrant, okay. Meaning that I was born in a foreign country, in a non-American foreign country, in a foreign system. Okay, I happen to have gotten American education from a young age. I only became American, I think, when I turned twenty, thereabouts. I forgot the exact. I think it was twenty-five. When I turned around twenty-five, I became American, and um. So for the last, so I've been American for a long time now, and 
in my 10 year journey in crypto and Bitcoin, I am now much more appreciative of the constitution of the of the uh, system of government of the elected you know government of the three separate branches of the separation of powers uh, that also the state rights stuff right it, it's 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 a it's a republic right we have it's kind of like like it's kind of like a um, what is it called it's not centralized right it's a federation that's why we call it the federal government meaning that it's it's sort of like a what's what it's a building block you have local township laws you have city law state laws and then you have you know and then you have the federal government right so i think i think it's important to have a structure like this because this really does give people the liberty and the freedom that we we should have as as uh, self-aware humans right yeah yeah i think so, that what um, i've seen that's i've seen a really encouraging trend where uh it seems to me like the politics that are being put in place in places like more liberal states like California and and more specifically San Francisco and LA. I've lived in both of these places. And it seems like the politics are having a, a negative influence on on the situation there. And I don't know exactly what how I think generally there's a lot more regulation than there needs to be. And that's causing a lot of stifling in the growth of these places. And people are leaving and they're moving to new places. And the, if you think of a government as as the the risk there is that it becomes so monopolistic, it's so centralized that that it becomes stale and and crusty when there's one policy and that policy doesn't work anymore. But there's no competition to leave. Well, we have states, so people can move from one state exactly. to the other, which effectively exactly. is like it's like if you think of a free market, you have one company that's great, and then it become it raises prices so high that no one wants it. Well, then another company pops up, and I I think that the number of states like having fifty is a decent amount. It's not like three. You know, it's enough where if you want like low taxes, you can move to Nevada or Florida or Alaska. Yeah. But if you want, you know, you, you can go to different places with different things. And I, I think that is drastically underappreciated. You oh, know, yeah, the, yeah. just the, with you. that idea and building companies in different places. Um, there, there seems to be much less freedom to move to different countries. I, I don't know if that's if you pick up on that as well or if. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so you're absolutely um, right. So I, I that's why I have um, much more appreciation for how governments are formed. You know the history. So I, as I've gone more educated about Bitcoin, I've gone more educated about the world as well. So that's been that's been a fun journey. You mentioned Bitcoin a lot. Your book is about Bitcoin. Do you feel Bitcoin is? Uh, you know, there's a lot of different cur- cryptocurrencies out there now. Do you? Bitcoin was the first. It's now the biggest. I mean, you you must dive into other cryptos. Do you have an allegiance <laughs> to Bitcoin? What, tell me about your your view on Bitcoin versus other currencies. So, so, so Bitcoin has a specific let me, purpose. Let me give me spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. This book does not uh, pretty much doesn't talk about other crypto. So I unashamedly talk about Bitcoin in this book. And part of the reason, so that's why it's called the Promise of Bitcoin. I, I had a choice, right? I, I th- when talking to my publishers, I really made a point that that I want to write a book about Bitcoin. And you. Yes, Bitcoin sort of represents overall crypto. So you could think about Ethereum, Litecoin, Dogecoin in the same context. But the reason I wrote this coin, this book about Bitcoin is that for me, I really want to help target the mass market, the newbies, the people who are either on the sitting on the fence, you know, they've heard of Bitcoin, they're curious about it, but they're not quite sure exactly what about Bitcoin. So, so, so for that audience, I didn't want to pollute. The conversation and talk about Ethereum, ERC twenty tokens, stable coins, NFTs, you know, smart contracts, blockchain. There's all kinds of books for that kind of top, those kind of topics. But I really want to have a catch-all sort of uh, just just let's talk about the fundamentals, which is money. So it's called the subtitle is the future of money and how it can work for you. Okay, the future of money and how it can work for you. So so the idea there is, I think this is the future of money. This is freedom of money. This is this is a brand new asset class. Well, not brand new. It's 12 years old now. But it really is a new asset class to the world, and it's a digital asset class. And because the world has embraced the internet, we now have a need for a digital asset class that can be moved freely on the internet with zero friction. And this is what, this what, Bitcoin, this what Bitcoin is. And how it can work for you, that's sort of talking about Bitcoin as an investment, as the as a single best investment in this op- investment opportunity in, in our lifetime. So I've benefited greatly from that, and I want to share that and 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 um, spread the word, you know. And of mm-hmm. course, you know, it's a selfish kind of thing because if I get to if I succeed in spreading Bitcoin to the whole world, 
then it's going to make Bitcoin price go up even more and I'm going to be happier. Mm, I see. Yeah. And also it helps yeah. your, helps your company. Just, I think it's a great option for people to have this hardware, uh, piece. Oh yeah. Uh, you're, you're talking about the wallet, right? Yeah. yeah the they, wallet. They yeah. Both target the, they both target the same audience, which is new people coming into the Bitcoin industry. By the way, this is a multi-currency wallet, right? So, so it stores all kinds of cryptos. So the, these are targeting the same people, which is people who are curious about Bitcoin, curious about cryptocurrency. They don't get it. Like what's a big deal? Well, read this book. And then once you get it, you want to buy Bitcoin, go buy a Bitcoin and put it on here. <laughs> That's the idea. I love it. Are, are more people using, where is, is the US the main population or China main population for the, uh, for the card? Oh, the, the wallet. So we, we uh, so first of all, the wallet, all the languages in English, uh, the packaging. So we, we, we make it in the US. We ship it all over the world. We have these in, um, in uh, Amazon all over the world. And I think 12 different marketplaces on Amazon, Amazon, US, Canada, Mexico, all the Amazons in Europe, and we're opening more as we go. And uh, we also have stores in China as well. So we have resellers in over 30 countries. We have over 30 resellers worldwide. We have a sales affiliate program and, and all that stuff. So you can, you can buy this all over the world. Uh, it's not just in the U.S. Hmm. And, and then the book, um, uh, the book is published in the U.S. It's published on – coming out on May 17th. Uh, you can get on – you can order on Amazon. You can all the order it from uh, bobbylee.com. That's my blog website, bobbylee.com. Uh, it's coming on Amazon Kindle. There's an audiobook version coming out wow. in the summer. Uh, and then I think two countries already signed up for translations. I think Korea and uh, Portuguese language. I think you know Portugal and I think those two countries, those two languages. So it's going to be translated in at least two more country, two more languages. Now, and for, so, so we don't have any news about China yet. We don't. We'll see whether the Chinese uh, <laughs> want to translate this. Oh, interesting. Uh, tell me for a second about the process of writing a book. How how long? Did this? Oh, I mean, how many hours a day were you putting in on gosh, this? Gosh, it was crazy. So I wanted to do this. I wanted to do this probably before 2018, but all all through those years, I was busy running BTCC. So after I sold the company, I finally had the time to say, okay, let me let me start, uh, you know, put writing a book. So I started the book project in 2018. It was on and off for a while. I was trying to find a publisher. I wrote an introduction chapter and all that stuff with a with a with a um, outline and all that and um and then i found mcgraw hill i think we we signed on with them um uh i have my book agent so i think that was uh 2019 or so and then of course covid hit so that 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 getting into covid was a delay but towards the end of last year i finally powwowed through finished the writing and um it took a long time it took a long time just and then all the revisions and then they involved more editors so, and then even, even up through this year, like, I think I was still editing the final documents. There were three more passes for me to edit, uh, back and forth with, with the copy editors. So that was in February. I think we finally, everything was locked in in March. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it was, uh, you, like a three, two, three year effort. What would you, at ballpark, what would you say your best guess as to how many hours this took you to write? I, I'm just out of curiosity. Uh, over a thousand hours thousand yeah that's awesome yeah just yeah. just yeah but, well congratulations yeah. on getting this out and having a company at the same time uh, yes, yes, i really yes. enjoyed our <laughs> conversation bobby i I, yes. I just i think you're in such an interesting position having run a crypto company in china and and, and have a vantage point of both countries because they're both you know major powers in the world and we're at a really exciting time in crypto so uh yeah congrats again on all the progress and and i really enjoyed having you on and and diving into all these things. Uh, before we jump, though, mention where you mentioned your website, bobbylee.com. Are you active <clears> on social as well? Yeah, on Twitter. So Twitter is my main uh, social media platform. It's Bobby C. Lee. So it's at B O B B Y C L E E. Uh, C is uh, so it's just like the right here, Bobby C. Lee. Mm -hmm. uh, my middle name is Christopher. So <clears throat> that's my Twitter account. So our, our <clears throat> for ballet, it's balletcrypto.com. Sorry, balletcrypto.com. That's a website. You can order, mm -hmm. uh, buy your wallets from there. You can search for ballet wallets on Amazon. You could buy from our store. And then this will be on Amazon as well. So very excited. Love it. I love it, man. All right, brother. Well, I hope we'll have you back on someday when Indeed. you write your next book. <laughs> Well, <laughs> no, there's no second book at this point. We'll see how well this sells first. If, if it's flat, then uh, no more books from me. All right. Take care, Bobby. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye.